Hello, welcome. You are joining us now for a chat with CCL Government Affairs. Whether you've come back from the break or you're just tuning in, we are glad that you are here. I am Mindy Aller, and I am part of our liaison coordinator team and also the Northwind Regional Coordinator for Citizens Climate Lobby. I am delighted to moderate this session with our amazing government affairs team, who will tell you the latest breaking news related to our work on climate, give a quick overview of our lobby week, and then take some questions from you. We are very fortunate at CCL to have these two talented individuals on our team. Ben Pendergrass is our CCL Vice President of Government Affairs. He has worked for over 14 years in Washington, both as congressional staff and as a government relations professional. He's worked in a wide range of policy areas and he's successfully advanced standalone le legislation, as well as provisions in annual appropriations bills, tax extender legislation and farm bills. And Jen Tyler is our CCL Senior Director of Government Affairs and the other half of our liaison coordinator team. Jen has spent over seven years in public service, serving as congressional staff. Throughout her time as congressional staff, Jen handled a broad policy portfolio, and she's developed strong relationships throughout Washington on both sides of the aisle and has extensive experience in successfully crafting and advancing legislative initiatives. So you can see why we are so lucky that both Ben and Jen now spend their time helping CCL volunteers and staff understand what's happening in Congress and how we can all be effective in advancing our important climate agenda. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ben, to get this conversation started. Thank you so much for that introduction, Mindy. And thank you all for joining us today. You know, we want to have a nice, relaxing chat and give you a chance to ask a lot of questions. But first, Jen is going to give a brief overview of the lobby asks for next week. And I want to talk just a little bit about some things that have been happening in D.C. in the last week or two. So if you want to give the lay of the land, Jen, that'd be great. Yeah, happy to, and so glad to be here with everyone. And many of you joined us on our recent training calls on all of these asks. So if you haven't already, there's recordings, they'll be put in the chat, go back and revisit those and you'll get a ton more detailed information on all of our asks. But as an overview, there's obviously a lot going on in climate in Congress, but there's a few real key climate opportunities. And that's how we really based our primary asks on what are the big climate opportunities coming up. The first one, as Dana has mentioned and covered very thoroughly, is permitting reform. There's several big legislative packages that have to pass Congress, like the Government Funding Package, the National Defense Authorization Act, and those are the best chances for permitting reform to move. So we lobbied once in June on getting a bipartisan comprehensive permitting reform package. Now we're drilling down more into specifics. And we're prioritizing permitting reform because every piece of fossil fuel infrastructure that we pull offline, we need to replace with clean energy. Right now, we can't get these new clean energy projects connected to the grid in the time and at the scale that we need. And that's a real barrier, as Dana illuminated with his slides, to reducing emissions overall. So we've got to address it. Transmission is one of the stickiest and also the most important pieces of permitting reform to get that energy on the grid and get it sent across the country. So that's what we're focusing on this lobby day. Our primary ask is going to be the Big Wires Act. And that's a bill that calls for mandatory minimum transfer rates that's going to allow more clean energy to come on the grid and be dispersed across the country. The second biggest opportunity for climate legislation in this Congress is going to be the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is a legislation that governs almost all of our agriculture and forestry policy in this country, and it comes up for reauthorization every five years, this year being one of those five. And this brings me to our first secondary ask, the TSP Access Act. That bill increases the number of technical service providers who help farmers, ranchers, and foresters access conservation programs. We're hopeful that if we gain enough support for that bill, it's going to be included in the upcoming Farm Bill. And lastly, a bill I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, we are lobbying on the RISE Act for our final secondary ask. That's a bill that we nearly got across the finish line last Congress, and we're taking another stab at it given the growing need and the growing momentum. I'm sure you guys have seen the news articles on different offshore wind energy projects across the country, most recently in New York, that are coming under increasing threat and sometimes not moving forward due to the cost. This bill is going to provide additional financial incentive for states to move forward on these projects, which is critical in order for us to get to our clean energy targets. So again, please look up those trainings that we held uh, this past week or two, and you'll find a lot more detailed information on these asks. 
Um, but with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ben. You can talk a little bit about the other climate related things going on in Congress. Great. Thanks, Jen. That was a really good overview. Well, now I want to turn back the clock a little bit. I want to talk about a previous ask that we made specifically to Republicans back in 2022. We said, help America win. Have a look at a carbon border adjustment. We said America is winning when it comes to low carbon manufacturing. Senators Kramer, Cassidy, Graham, Graham Romney, Robert Lighthizer, former trade representative, have said America should make the rest of the world pay for their carbon emissions when we buy their goods. And we said we agree. And we asked the Republicans to have a look at a carbon border adjustment. Some Republicans have now done exactly what we asked them to do and gone a step further and actually introduced some bills. You might remember back in June, right before our June conference, Senator Kramer introduced the Prove It Act, which would help us learn what our emissions were for a lot of our products and see what the global emissions profile looked like for foreign products. But now, just last week, Senator Cassidy on Thursday introduced the Foreign Pollution Fee Act that would do just that level a fee on the carbon intensity of a range of imported goods. We don't have time to go into great detail on the bill now, but we will be talking more about that bill in the coming weeks. Needless to say, uh, Republicans, we have asked to come forward with ideas, and now they're starting to. But right now, I think it would be best to hear this straight from one of these leaders' mouths. Good greetings to everyone gathered for the Citizens Climate Lobby Conference, and a special hello to the North Dakotans in the audience. I really do wish I could be with you all today, but unfortunately, video is going to have to do for now. But we got really good at this, didn't we, during the pandemic? In recent years, you know, we've seen a lot of bad actors like Russia and China weaponize energy and, and industry to we weaken our critical supply chains. And Russia's weaponization, for example, of natural gas helped chart a path toward their invasion of Ukraine. Meanwhile, China has gained significant control of industries like renewable energy sources, critical minerals, and steel in an effort to make others think twice about retaliating should they invade Taiwan. Both of these bad actors share a common denominator, and they have used lax environmental standards and poor labor standards to undercut costs and monopolize essential industries. Now, to counter these actions, Senator Chris Coons and I uh, introduced the Bipartisan Prove-It Act to consolidate the data needed to hold these bad actors accountable. Now, if emissions matter in Bismarck, they should matter in Beijing. And for too long, American products and our strategic supply chains have been harmed by the overproduction of carbon intensive products produced with little to really no environmental stewardship. What our bill does is it validates and quantifies what I think we already understand, intuitively know, and that is that we produce goods and energy cleaner and better than anybody else in the world. The Prove It Act gives us real data and real numbers to back up our bold claims. This bill is just the first step. Ultimately, we must obtain this data to put in place what I believe tr to be trade mechanisms to hold these bad actors accountable. The punishment should be placed firmly on the world's polluters, not on our domestic excellence. Our businesses already pay a de facto carbon tax by complying with the strongest regulatory environment in the world. And we should resist the urge to pursue a punitive domestic carbon tax and instead target the bad actors. Global demand for resources is only going to continue growing. If emissions reduction is the goal, then the solution is to produce more in America and like-minded nations who care about environmental stewardship and who put it as a priority of their production. Ultimately, this proposition, I believe, is a win-win-win. We can reduce our reliance on unfriendly countries and bring down global emissions, all while strengthening ties with like-minded nations and helping U.S. manufacturing compete in the global marketplace. Our public policy should be focused on protecting and rewarding American workers for their contributions to our economic, environmental, and national security strengths. Instead of being on defense, I'm focused on proactive efforts to keep American excellence at the head of the global table. Now, you're all a very important part of that, and thank you for your support and advocacy on behalf of the Prove It Act. Keep pushing as we try to get more co-sponsors on this bill. And if I or my team can be of any assistance, please know that my door and our doors are always open. I hope you have a great conference. I look forward to chatting with you soon. Take care and God bless you all. That's a great message from Senator Kramer. And I, I really think Senator Kramer's leadership is moving the bipartisan conversation 
on climate forward and really will continue to do so. You know, we've been asking Republicans for years to bring forward their ideas on climate, and now they are. There was one more part of, to this, though. The week before last, Senator Cassidy, joined by Senator Kramer and some other Republicans, did introduce a non-binding resolution in the Senate that said a, they don't think a domestic carbon tax would be um, good. They said they thought it would be detrimental to our economy. One thing they were very clear about in introducing this is they said they really wanted to differentiate what they're trying to do on trade and carbon border tariffs from a domestic carbon tax. So they didn't want to muddy the message. And of course, we disagree with the sentiment that it would be detrimental to the American economy, but they want to do it so they can work in this other area of climate. And that's not a bad thing. One thing that I think we will see more of a, as we work on multiple policies is this, this dynamic play out where on some policies that we support will be supported by a member of Congress. And these other policies we support might not be supported by that same member of Congress. And we could, are just going to see that happen more and more with both Republicans and Democrats. I could talk for a long time about these issues, but we don't really have time to get into details today. But I know the Prove It Act and the Foreign Pollution Fee are moving the discussion in the right direction. And with that, I think we can start to take some questions. All right. Thank you for all of that. Um, it seems there's never a dull moment in Washington, D.C., and I'm glad that we have you there to help us distill what's important for us to know. So I'm actually going to start with a, a couple questions that were submitted in advance by our participants, and then we're also looking at the ones that are in the Q&A. Um, but a very general question, because I think sometimes people wonder, what does government affairs really mean? So can you just give me a picture of what is a day in the life of Ben and Jen really like? Well, I get to talk to Jen every day, which is great. Um, but that's what we do. We do a lot of talking, um, not just to each other. We talk to congressional offices on a regular basis, both in person meetings and through email. We're monitoring legislation that gets introduced. We're working with offices on legislation that might be forthcoming. Um, I don't want to monopolize this because Jen and I do a lot of the same things. One thing that we do that's probably a little bit different than a lot of government affairs professionals is we work a lot with you guys. Um, not everybody has this grassroots army behind them. And so a lot of what we're doing too is educational. Um, Jen, you wanna tackle that? Yeah, I think we we spend a, the bulk of our time um, on the Hill working with offices has been mentioned. And that's really, we're just trying to be an extension of, of you all. All of our meetings are really building off of the meetings you all have and the progress you've made. And I wish uh, sometimes I could record what we're hearing from staffers in those meetings because nine out of 10 times, it starts with them saying, they know their volunteers so well. They love what their volunteers are doing. They're so pleased. They're thrilled. They know what we're coming in to talk about already because you guys have already briefed them so thoroughly. Um, and, and the feedback is great. So you make our jobs incredibly easy going into these meetings. Um, and then the other piece is we do a lot of coalition building. So we work with other national groups here in D.C., um, to, to really further our asks, but also understand what are the other climate priorities that other groups are working on? How can we fit in together? Where are areas of common ground? Where are things maybe we don't agree on? And how do we navigate that? Um, so yeah, I would say between the Hill and coalition building, and then of course, working so closely with you all, those are our, our primary focuses. Thank you. Um, another question that we got in advance from Susan, um, do you have advice on working with a member of Congress who may be on the extreme end of the spectrum on either side? Yeah, I can start and then maybe you can you can chime in on things. I think the, you know, we heard such such great things, I think, from Van Jones that really helped frame how do we work across the aisle uh, with someone who doesn't have the same vision. And that's both on the far left and the far right. We're, we're an organization trying to build that common ground, trying to bring people together. So on either end, it can be challenging to really figure out how do we start talking about these things. There's going to be areas of disagreement. Um, with any member, but especially on the far ends of the spectrum, we might have to do some work there. And I think the key is first really trying to find that common ground. And Van Jones did a great job of discussing what language appeals to someone. How can we approach our issue of climate or maybe permitting reform, transmission, whatever we might be talking about from their perspective. But I think taking it 
even further step back and just trying to understand what motivates this member. What are the local issues that motivate them? What's their background that motivated them to come to Congress in the first place? And what are the real issues that kind of get to the heart of this member of Congress? And then once we have that, we can figure out how do we relate our issues to that? How do we kind of thread these together? So we're really striking the nerves of this member and talking in a way that's going to hit home to them. Um, so I think that's the big thing. And then, of course, beyond just working with the member, so much of our influence comes from what we do in the district. So we have a monthly um, climate action program with different actions uh, that you can take. That's a great way to get involved and kind of beat the drum on some of these issues. Also doing LTEs, op-eds, writing in, in local press in a way that's going to, again, resonate with that member of Congress and getting engaged with your local chapter joining chapter meetings, figure out what, what are they doing, going to town halls the member might be hosting. So there's a lot we can do outside of the actual lobby meetings that are going to strengthen our position in those meetings and help those meetings become even more effective and fruitful. But I don't know, Ben, if you've got other tips. No, I think you really covered most of them. I mean, I think the biggest thing, and a lot of this we heard from, from Van Jones, you know, thinking about the ecosystem that they're living in, and I think generally covered it when she's talking about sometimes you got to step back from the office and really think about what you can do in the district and build support back home on the ground um, because that's going to have a big influence on members changing their minds. And we do see members evolve and change their minds and change their positions. Sometimes it takes a while, but it does happen. Yeah, one of the things I heard Van Jones say too was talking about rewards and punishment are the two things that motivate members of Congress. Um, and we clearly focus on the rewards side. Um, and I think, you know, do you really think that it, does it help in terms of that reward side or what are the effective ways we do that? Um, is that our letters to I the editor, things like that? I think it's in everything we do. I and mean, one of the things we have really been, and I always say like, Jen and I have some of the best jobs because we get to see the ways we're impactful that maybe don't come across uh, when you're in your meetings or in the media, but we hear directly from members and sometimes they're a little less guarded and they will say like, they really feel that CCL is effective. They feel like they've had a good experience and they know that even though they might not do everything we want them to do when they're doing it, it said it makes it easier for them to get there. Um, and, and there's so many people yelling at members of Congress and their staff and very confrontational. So there is a place for that. Some people are doing that. We're not the ones doing that. We're providing the the positive encouragement and it, it does work. It works better than people think it does. Yeah, and I I loved what Van Jones said, but there there was one uh, piece I, I do think from my time on the Hill didn't didn't resonate with me and, and didn't strike home. And that was the punishment side. And I, you know, I worked it for a moderate office, so a competitive seat that, you know, every two years it was questionable if we were going to win re-election. So there was a ton of money flowing into our district on both sides, people who wanted to unseat my boss, people who wanted my boss to stay. And truthfully, in my office, as I rose up the ranks and started seeing more of the political side, the folks who were doing scorecards, who were engaging in the elections and trying to, you know, really put out negative press, all of that, those were the groups we listened to the least. Um, you know, when, when groups would come in and lobby us, and we knew that that group had a scorecard that we had a C rating or a D rating or an F rating. And we knew they were going to be putting out quote unquote punishments, you know, political ads against my boss. That was not a group my boss wanted to meet with. Um, and we kind of just took it for what it was. We knew where they were going to be from start to finish. We didn't expect them to really be an ally of our office. So we didn't, we met with them if they were constituents, of course, but we didn't give them the consideration and the time that we gave someone like Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, we knew our CCL volunteers were going to be an ally to us from the start. They were not going to be involved, um, you know, in the election in, in terms of, you know, campaigning and, and doing that kind of thing. They were truly there to help educate us, understand the issues that were going on in our district, and try to find common ground and move my boss forward. And that, that level of trust, I think, is critical to really be able to have progress with a member of Congress. I don't think the, the punishment side of things really is effective uh, in the short run or, or the long run. And I'll give just a quick example. There was a competitive Senate race a few years ago for a moderate Republican who, you know, had really been doing some stuff on the environment and in climate, 
But the second there's a chance to really push on electing a Democrat, a lot of groups abandoned that member who they had worked with. And that left such a bad taste in that member's office that they basically had a list of like, these are the groups we're never going to work with again because we were working with them and they jumped ship the first chance they got. And that's not a good way to build long-term relationships and get things you want accomplished done. Good to know. We think we're doing it the right way. Um, Jana has asked, are there plans to promote the Dem and Republican joining the Climate Solutions Caucus together as partners like they did at the beginning? Um, and I'll just add to that. And should I be asking my member to join? And what is the Climate Solutions Caucus up to right now? Yeah, great question. So the Climate Solutions Caucus, which if you guys aren't familiar, it's a bipartisan group of House members. It's now up to about 60 members, so 30 Democratic members, 30 Republican members um, that works on climate. They try to find common ground and in, in bipartisan progress on climate. CCL was instrumental in getting that first established, and it has been relaunched this Congress. So Congressman Garbarino, who's a Republican, and Congresswoman Houlihan, who's a Democrat, have relaunched the caucus. It is up and running. One of its first official acts was to host a bipartisan briefing. Um, they actually asked us to host it. They asked CCL to host it on permitting reform. After the great job you all did in June lobbying on permitting reform, they came to us and said, hey, we want to take that information and distribute it out to our staff. So Dana, who you just heard from, did a fantastic briefing for the staff of the Climate Solutions Caucus on permitting reform. And it was a really fantastic forum to talk about the issue and have them be able to ask questions in an, in an open format. In terms of asking your member to join the group, you know, we've heard from the caucus co-chairs that they're not in a period of growth right now. And that's why we're not making that a secondary ask to, to ask every member to join. That being said, if you think it would be an effective ask, if you think your member would be interested, it's someone who does work across the aisle, who would want to find that bipartisan common ground, then absolutely, I think, don't hesitate in asking. And they they will add folks as on a two-by-two two basis, so we would clarify that for the offices. Um, but we're just not making it a broad ask right now just because the caucus is not looking to grow at that rate. They're still trying to get a little bit of their feet under them and really move on permitting reform. That's their primary focus right now. But if you think it'll be helpful for your member, definitely make that ask. Um, and we're happy to support you in that. Thank you. Um, our most upvoted question right now is from Ray, and I'm going to add a little to it because it's similar to some that we got in advance as well. Um, looking at, at the fact that there's this anti-carbon price language that's come out that you spoke to a little bit here, Ben, um, what does that mean for our plans for following up with our advocating for a price on carbon? And that's similar to some who've asked, why aren't we why aren't we using that as one of our asks uh, in this round of lobby days? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I think Dana articulated really well was just the dire need for permanent reform like right now. And we know we have a window to get it done this Congress. And if we don't get it done in the near term, a lot of the victory of the IRA will be for not like we've got to get that money out into the world, into these clean energy projects now, or it's going to go away. And so we really have that timeline that makes it really important for us to focus on permanent reform right this now. As far as the resolution goes, I mean, a lot of these members have been on the record as not being there on a carbon price yet. So this is nothing new. This is not new opposition. And I think what's most interesting about the resolution is they're doing it so they can do other climate work. You know, before it was someone see some of this in the past, it was like, we don't want to do anything on climate and we don't want to do a carbon price. Now they're saying, not that, but let's focus on lowering global emissions. And that's where we want to really work on it. And that's what's not as satisfying for us to see some of our, you know, champions on one piece of um, climate legislation, not supporting another piece of that. Um, I don't think it really changes the dy dynamics of I mean, anything. You know, we didn't see, um, it wasn't like every member jumped on board that resolution. Um, and so I don't think it really impacts what we're doing and we'll keep working on a carbon price um, and work with the members that we can um, that do support it. Like there are members that are on the record as supporting it, like uh, Senator Romney. Um, and so we'll work on growing those ranks. So a uh, related question then is this idea of a 
border carbon adjustment that we have always tied to a carbon price um, versus this idea of working on a carbon price without a border, I mean, a border adjustment without a carbon price. So can you talk a little bit more about kind of the politics or the substance, maybe some of the subtleties of how we work on, on both that might, we what we think is linked and that others have, have taken apart into two different pieces? Yeah, I can start a little bit and then Jane can jump in if she wants to. I mean, one of the great things is, and you've heard me say this before, almost I can guarantee every congressional office um, the first time they heard the words carbon border adjustment mechanism were from CCL volunteers. So that is just alone that they are talking about this. I think we should really own that as a success. We had this three-legged stool. We want, we like all of them, but one of them is gaining particular traction with Republicans. And that's great because then they're being very clear that they want to look at emissions globally and see this as a global problem that we can't just bring down our emissions here and let China and other actors continue to increase their emissions. And that's why we had it as part of like any carbon pricing strategy needed that carbon border adjustment mechanism. And so I know um, we always said like they should be combined, but we shouldn't just reflexively dismiss um, this movement um, because it's not the entire package. Uh, I think it's definitely forward progress. And one thing we're going to have to look at both with um, Senator Cassidy's bill, and there's probably some more bills coming as well. Um, we'll be looking at those policies and seeing what really could work, what would be beneficial. And this policy debate is far from over here in DC. Everybody's having a discussion about um, whether or not the, this is the best design um, carbon border tariff, or if there are other ways that are more effective to get it done. And we'll be we'll be in that debate and monitoring that debate. Um, Jen, do you want to add anything there? Oh, I'll just second. There's a lot yet to be seen on the policy front in terms of what the best construction would be, and also would a uh, carbon border adjustment would it uh, run afoul of of WTO rules? That's one of the big concerns. Would it actually be able to be implemented, or would it be struck down? So there's a lot yet to be seen, but. I second what Ben said. This is a huge success for Citizens Climate Lobby for all the work you all have done for years. Um, I think you, if you, even if you ask these same Republican senators, even two years ago, would you be able to introduce a CBAN bill? They probably would have said no. They would have said, I'm not interested. But that's how quickly you all have changed their minds. That's how quickly you all have grown the support and the understanding for a CBAM for emissions writ large. And I'm just, I'm thrilled uh, that this bill is out there. It might not, you know, we might not know everything about the policy details, but to have a CCL originated policy like a CBAM out there on the main stage introduced by Senate Republicans, some of the leaders in the Senate on the Republican side, it's just a huge, huge victory and is only going to help us get closer and closer to our goals overall and moving the entire Republican party forward. Um, on climate in a way that I think a lot of us didn't know was was quite possible a few years ago. And I'll just throw in there too, I didn't get a chance to mention other exciting things with this discussion is it wasn't just Senator Cassidy, it was Senator Graham and Roger Wicker from Mississippi, a Mississippi Republican introducing a climate bill. That's a big deal. And on Prove It Act just in the last month or so, um, Senator Bozeman from Arkansas pretty red state and a very respected conservative leader jumped on that bill. Um, and so that's, that's something. Well, thank you. That's all we have time for today. There was one other question. And I think um, I just want to add it as a comment that we are not suggesting that people uh, use the foreign pollution fee as a secondary ask, correct? Because we have not had time to study it in detail. No, it was just introduced. And we will we will provide more resources on that bill in the future, um, just to educate ourselves on it. But it is not a secondary ask for right now. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jen and Ben, for keeping us on track uh, and for keeping that close eye in D.C. for us. Um, with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Ellie Sparks, who's going to lead us in our next session of CCL Group Leaders Tell All. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, 
national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.